Please welcome the director of DARPA's Defense Sciences Office, Dr. Valerie Browning. Welcome to the D60 plenary session on combating weapons of mass destruction and terror threats. I'm Valerie Browning. I am the director of DARPA's Defense Sciences Office, and I'm going to be your moderator for this morning's session. In July of 1963, while addressing the American public about the importance of the soon-to-be-signed Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, President John F. Kennedy said the following, I ask you to stop and think for a moment what it would mean to have nuclear weapons in so many hands. In countries large and small, stable and unstable, responsible and irresponsible, scattered throughout the world. There would be no rest for anyone then. There would be only an increased chance of accidental war and the increased necessity for the great powers to become involved in what otherwise would be local conflicts. In 2018, there are nine countries believed to possess nuclear weapons, and the arsenal of weapons capable of inflicting mass destruction and terror has expanded to include chemical and biological warfare agents. So over the past 55 years, what have we learned about our ability to deter de uh, and protect ourselves against these attacks? How safe are we today? And what new threats might we face in the future, and what will we do about those threats? Those are some of the questions that we're going to be exploring in today's panel session with our distinguished panel of subject matter experts. The format for the session is as follows. We will have an introductory presentation by our keynote speaker, and then we're going to hear uh, some discussion from each of our other panel members from bringing their own perspective uh, and experience and insights. All of this will tee up an interactive question and answer dialogue that will fill the remainder of the, the session. We'd like you to submit your questions using the D60 app on your smartphone, your tablet, or your laptop. So without any further delay, let me introduce our panelists. Our first panelist has dedicated his entire professional career to countering nuclear chemical and biological threats and strengthening global health security. His 30 years of government service include five and a half years as President Obama's Assistant Secretary of Defense for nuclear chemical and biological defense programs. He served as a driving force behind the Nunn Lugar Cooperative Threat Reduction, which among other things led to the removal of weapons grade uranium from Kazakhstan and Georgia and the destruction of Libyan and Syrian chemical weapons arsenals. He currently serves on the board of the Arms Control Association, as well as the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies International Advisory Council. Please welcome to the stage the Honorable Andrew Weber. Our second panelist is a former director of the Los Alamos, Na Los Alamos National Laboratory, and he current ser currently serves as a professor emeritus for research in the Department of Management Science and Engineering at Stanford, as well as senior fellow emeritus at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies and the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University. He is recognized throughout the world as an expert in nuclear weapons policy, plutonium research, and global nuclear risk reduction with Russia, China, Pakistan, India, North Korea, and Iran. His many accomplishments have been acknowledged in numerous awards, including the Presidential Enrico Fermi Award, the National Academy of Engineering Arthur M. Bush Award, and the 2018 American Association of Engineering Societies National Engineering Award. Please welcome Dr. Siegfried Hecker. Our third panelist is an award-winning, world-renowned journalist, author, documentary producer, and terrorism expert. He's authored five books, three of which have been on the New York Times bestseller list, and four of which have been named among the nonfiction books of the year by the Washington Post. 
He currently serves as the Vice, Vice President for Global Studies and Fellow and the Director of the International Security Program and the Future of War Program at the New America in Washington, D.C. You've seen him on TV as CNN's National Security Analyst, and he also serves as a fellow at Fordham University Senator on National Security. Please welcome Mr. Bergen, Mr. Peter Bergen. And finally, I would like to introduce our keynote and fourth panelist. He currently serves as a DARPA DSO program manager with interests involving the development of new technologies for countering weapons of mass destruction. He also has served as a staff physicist at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory where he developed advanced accelerator and plasma-based radiation sources for national security applications, including the detection of illicit materials. Please welcome Dr. Vincent Tang. Thank you, Valerie. Today, rapid technological change has given us powerful tools for scientific exploration and engineering that continues to improve the lives of billions of people. These tools are fundamentally democratic. Capabilities that were once reserved for nation states are now available to even individuals. Across the world, in maker spaces, university labs, and startups, Innovators can communicate in real time, access libraries worth of information instantly, rapidly evaluate their prototypes via sophisticated computer simulations and 3D printing techniques. In the bio world, emerging and exciting techniques allow us to edit and modify genomes precisely. And this is just a sampling of some of the advances of the last decades that have enabled an era of unprecedented development and innovation. We've all been able to do more, faster, and with less. And this has been an undeniably good thing. But the last decades have also shown us the dark side of the democratization of these advanced tools and platforms. Even an impoverished nation like North Korea has been able to stand up a nuclear capability at a fraction of the cost required during the Cold War and against the will of the international community. Terror groups like ISIS have now leveraged commercially available drones for attacks and have deployed chemical weapons. And as technology makes the proliferation, development, and use of weapons of mass destruction, or WMDs, easier, we've also seen an upsurge in terror activities and the growth of non-state actors bent on destruction. So this is also a time where our adversaries can do more, faster, and with less. These trends set the stage for our discussion today. We have a diverse group of actors, ranging from anxious countries to rogue nations to terror groups. Powerful tools and capabilities for rapid design and manufacture, and a global diffusion of knowledge and expertise. You add all these things up together, and the potential for proliferation, diffusion, and the use of weapons of mass destruction can seem almost inevitable. So what can we do to counter these threats and minimize the possibility of WMD use? What can we do to best deter and prevent their proliferation, sense their whereabouts, and interdict their development? These are actually familiar problems. Ever since its inception, DARPA has been developing transformative technologies to counter and deter the use of weapons of mass destruction and to defend our homeland. In the 1960s, DARPA's Project Vela established the world's first worldwide nuclear test ban treaty monitoring system. This includes both space-based and seismic-based nuclear detonation detectors, and this network of sensors made the first test ban treaty possible by establishing a mechanism for its enforcement and verification. And this ultimately helped deter and prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons decades ago. At the same time, these sensors made wonderful scientific discoveries. 
The satellites saw the first cosmic gamma ray bursts from supernovas and neutron stars helping scientists to map the universe. And the seismic sensors helped confirm the theory of plate tectonics, revolutionizing the field of seismology. This legacy of science and national security continues to inspire us today as we face our versions of the same challenge. Our mission is the same, but the landscape has shifted. Ubiquitous technologies have lowered the barrier for the development of WMDs, added new attack modes via potentially novel chemical and biological threats, and increased the number of adversaries who might develop and use these weapons from the tactical to the strategic level. So how do we counter the increasingly distributed nature of this threat today? At DARPA, we think the challenges today can be summed up in two words, scalability and adaptability. The technologies we built to deter, sense, and interdict WMDs must not only be transformative at the device level, but must also be scalable in order to enable wide spatial and temporal coverage of that distributed and multifaceted nature of today's range of threats. The system must also leverage emerging technology trends and platforms so that it's rapidly adaptable and reconfigurable to successfully counter that wider variety and of attack scenarios that we face today. So what might these technologies look like? What is a system that allows us to sense a wide range of WMD activity look like today? What is the Vela of today? These are questions we're starting to answer at DARPA through both the Sigma program and the new Sigma Plus initiative. We started the Sigma program in 2014 to provide practical and scalable continuous detection capability for radiological and nuclear threats at the city scale. Sigma successfully developed low-cost, high-capability sensors with a real-time IT backbone that could network, ingest, and analyze data from up to 10,000 mobile sensors in real time, allowing for full city-scale coverage. At the same time, we've also successfully produced more than 10,000 fully automated spectroscopic mobile sensors, such as these. And we field tested the system as a whole in multiple areas. We gave those pocket-sized detectors to first responders to wear, and we emplaced larger ones in vehicle fleets, such as the DC fire and EMS ambulance fleets, and we deployed static detectors at key choke points. So up here is a snapshot of the city-scale coverage we had of the road network in DC from one of our multiple field trials. The Sigma system is now transitioning to federal, state, and local partners, as well as our ally partners, and we're really excited and proud of the work that we've done there. So Sigma was focused on the rat nuke problem, and now we're going after the rest of the threats. To do this, we have created a unique new DARPA initiative that spans multiple offices and technology domains. Over the next five years, the new Sigma Plus initiative will build on Sigma's successful strategy of distributed network and scalable mobile sensing to develop and demonstrate a real-time, persistent early detection system for that full spectrum of chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosive threats. We'll do this not only by building on the physical sensor networks developed under Sigma, but by also leveraging advanced advances in data fusion, automated intelligence analytics, and adversary modeling in order to form a fully holistic system for real-time sensing. Just imagine being able to sense and find safe houses and illicit labs in megacities that are making chemical warfare agents or explosives and being able to stop them before those materials are weaponized. Imagine if we were able to sense weeks earlier that a pandemic, natural or man-made, is in progress, allowing us to get medicines and vaccines over to the right places rapidly. In short, this is our vision for today's Vela, for countering that full spectrum of WMD threats. 
I'm very excited that Sigma and Sigma Plus are building on DARPA's legacy of large-scale sensing for countering WMDs and to help defend our homeland. This is just one of several efforts at DARPA that is gonna help us deter, counter, and mitigate these threats, and to do so in ways that are truly scalable and adaptive. So DARPA works to tackle the toughest problems in national security, and I think few are harder or more important than this one. It's clear that WMDs remain a persistent threat, and they'll remain so over the next several decades. And while some have taken advantage of the democratization of these advanced tools and platforms to proliferate WMDs, it is DARPA's mission to adapt and scale those same advances to counter the threat. And I think in order for us to be able to successfully do this, I think there's questions that DARPA and the community must address. So some of the important ones include, for example, understanding what are the lessons learned from the last 60 years of counterproliferation, and how do we apply them to this new diffuse threat landscape? Will the increasing ease and accessibility of technology encourage new groups and which groups to pursue these weapons? Are there new types of WMDs that we haven't even thought about? Ultimately, what is the future of combating this threat? So over the next few hour or so, uh, our distinguished panel will give us their insight into some of these questions. First, we'll hear from Mr. Andy Weber, who will share his experiences, lessons learned, and his thoughts about that emerging landscape. We'll then hear from Dr. Sikhecker, who will discuss his perspective on nuclear and radiological terrorism, and assessing adversary nuclear weapons capabilities. And then we'll also hear from Mr. Peter Bergen, who will share his insights about WMDs and non-state actors, as well as the future of terrorism. Thank you for your attention today, and I look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you, Vincent. Valerie, DARPA, DARPA alumni, friends, supporters. Today I'm going to talk about countering weapons of mass destruction terrorism. And by this, I mean nuclear, chemical, or biological attacks carried out by small <clears throat> groups or even individuals, strategic attacks. And I believe for the reasons Vincent laid out, that this is, other than the risk of a full-out nuclear weapons exchange between states, this is the greatest global and national security risk of the 21st century. And for me, it's, uh, it's not hypothetical. As a young Foreign Service officer serving in uh, Almaty, Kazakhstan, I was approached by my automobile mechanic, Slava, and he asked me if I wanted to buy some uranium. And this led over a period of months to the discovery in a factory in northeastern Kazakhstan near the border with Russia, Mongolia, and China, a cache of 600 kilograms of highly enriched uranium 90% U-235 protected by a good padlock. <laughs> and I held some of this uranium in my hand and together with the government of Kazakhstan, which renounced nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction that it had inherited, we did a secret operation called Project Sapphire and shipped this cache of HEU back to the United States to Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where it was blended down into uh, power reactors. And because only a big industrial state can produce plutonium and HEU, the bomb material that you need for a nuclear weapon, we've done a lot in the last 25 years to make it harder for terrorists to access these materials. The number of countries that have bomb quantities 
of these materials has been cut more than half from over 50 to around 20 today. There's a lot more we can do, but I believe the threat of nuclear terrorism, while the consequences are grave, I think we've made significant progress. Um, turning to bio, this is also very real to me. In June of 1995, I visited the world's largest anthrax factory in a place called Stepnogorsk, Kazakhstan, a secret city that was never on a map just known by a post office box. And this is one of 10 four-story high, 20,000 liter fermenters in a biosafety level four high containment fermentation hall that was capable of producing 300 metric tons of anthrax agent. That is an existential scale of anthrax when you think about what less than a gram did to the United States uh, Senate office buildings in the fall of 2001. I also visited with Larry Lynn the laboratory in Siberia in January of 1998 that developed smallpox as a weapon, the Vector Laboratory. So the Soviet Union had done a lot of work on biological weapons and they considered them on a par with nuclear weapons. I'm also very concerned about chemical weapons. Although we've had a lot of success, thanks to the Chemical Weapons Convention and the Nobel Prize winning Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. Here I'm with the Director General Ahmed Azumchu, overseeing the destruction of the last of Gaddafi's chemical weapons, 517 artillery rounds filled with mustard that could have been used as improvised chemical weapon terrorist devices. In Syria, under the threat of nuclear, or under the threat of military force, we were able, without firing a shot, to remove and destroy 1,300 tons of VX, sarin, and chemical agent materials that can no longer be used by the Assad regime against its own people or its neighbors. While they, they do continue small-scale attacks, they've reconstituted some capability, the strategic threat has been safely removed. We used to talk about five rogue states with WMD programs. And we've made a lot of progress in the last 30 years. We're really down to one major one, and that's North Korea. And we hear a lot about their nuclear weapons and missile programs, which have gone very far, advanced beyond our expectations, much faster than we expected. But that's because they brag about them. They release videos of their celebrations of missile launches. They show us their possibly thermonuclear weapon. But their biological weapons program is very advanced, and we rarely, if ever, hear about it because they don't talk about it. They don't brag about it. But I'm deeply concerned about North Korea's advanced biological weapons program that has applied some of the new technologies that we've heard about in the last few days in this 21st century of biology. Also, North Korea mounted what I would call a state-sponsored WMD attack in Kuala Lumpur when Kim Jong-un assassinated his brother with a covert operation using the chemical weapon VX at the airport in Kuala Lumpur. Russia, similarly, in Salisbury, launched a WMD terrorist attack. We now know, through an amazing investigation, that it was two GRU troops who delivered that attack. They intended to kill one person with Novichok chemical weapons. But that capability for state-sponsored WMD attacks, think about what they could do if they had a different intent. That same capability small groups of one or two people 
maybe in 50 parts of the world at once or in succession, could kill in each attack hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people. And that's why I think this is an existential risk, because while we have traditional groups like ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Lashkar, that have not made great progress in developing weapons of mass destruction, although I think over time it's becoming more accessible and easier, when you have a state behind it, it changes the game. I want to talk about fentanyls, because this changes the capability gap that the traditional terrorist groups have had. People don't often remember that in 2002, Russian special forces pumped fentanyl into a theater that had been taken hostage by a group of Chechen terrorists. They killed all the hostage takers and over 100 of the hostages. That was fentanyl, the same fentanyl that you can now buy as part of the heroin trade, produced in, in laboratories, mostly in China, ordered through mail order, weapons of mass destruction for sale on an established market. That changes the capability challenge for terrorist groups. They can buy it. And this is the first time in my lifetime that I'm aware of weapons of mass destruction that are available on an established market. And that causes me grave concern. I don't have my head around what we need to do to prevent that. But smart people like you need to attack this problem because it's potentially a strategic risk to our security. This is a uh, public health laboratory in downtown Kiev, Ukraine, with a young junior senator from Illinois in 2005. And from that kitchen refrigerator, I'm holding a vial of Bacillus anthracis, the causative agent of anthrax. So the potential for biological terrorism is real. Unlike plutonium and HEU, these materials are widely available. And frankly, I don't understand why terrorists have not yet succeeded in launching a large-scale biological weapons attack. So I have a challenge for each of you in this room as thought leaders, as scientists, as soldiers. Think about the day after a massive strategic attack using nuclear, chemical, or biological weapons. What is it but for a lack of imagination that we could have done to have prevented that attack? Because we must not let the worst weapons of the 20th century darken the 21st. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, Valerie, Vincent, thank you very much. Uh, and a particular congratulations to DARPA uh, for 60 years of service to the nation, proud past. And from what I saw yesterday in the tour that I was able to receive, obviously an exciting future to come. So I'm going to stick uh, to the nuclear uh, situation because that's been my beat since I joined uh, Los Alamos as a summer student 53 years ago. Uh, and Vincent has set the stage very nicely uh, in terms of taking a look at how the technological trends might actually change these challenges. And, and so what I thought I would do in this short time uh, is to divide the nuclear world that, that we're going to talk about into proliferation and terrorism. And I'm going to use the following framework of saying that we need to understand the motivation in both cases, and we need to understand the capabilities. So in the capabilities in the nuclear arena, you need three things. Uh, you need the bomb fuel, and as you've already heard, that would be highly enriched uranium uh, or plutonium. Uh, you need to be able to weaponize, uh, and that means design, build, and test uh, uh, the weapon. And then you need to be able to deliver it. 
So I'm, I use that framework to take a look at, at these two categories. In, in the proliferation arena, I'm talking about proliferation uh, of nuclear weapons to states. The motivation, as we study history and as I already pointed out, uh, you know, there are less than 10 countries in the world uh, that have nuclear weapons today. Although over the years, you know, perhaps as many as 30 have actually attempted or explored to develop uh, nuclear weapons. But there are less than 10 uh, today. The motivation, as we look at history, is primarily to deter some adversary. Well, to deter, if you think about that, you need to have a nuclear arsenal. You know, one bomb doesn't do it. You need to have a nuclear arsenal. Uh, and for that nuclear arsenal, you would need the bomb fuel. You would need on the order of, let's say, hundreds of kilograms uh, of highly enriched uranium uh, and or plutonium. To weaponize, you need to have a science and technology base. Uh, and to deliver, uh, in, if you're going to deter, you really need to have missiles. So you need to have a rocket uh, or a, a missile program. Uh, and as we look back, you know, particularly over the last couple of decades, uh, the most problematic cases have been uh, actually South Africa, uh, which developed a very small arsenal, gave it up. India and Pakistan, which still represent uh, sort of the most dangerous place uh, today in the nuclear world. Uh, and then North Korea. Uh, those are the ones that had developed and have developed nuclear weapons. Of course, there are a number of others, and Iran particularly falls on top of that list, uh, that have developed the option to build uh, the bomb. If we look at North Korea closely, and I've done that uh, ever since 2004, when I first went uh, to North Korea. So North Korea does have a nuclear arsenal. We don't know exactly how many, but on the order of quite a few hundreds of kilograms of bomb fuel, maybe 30 or so uh, nuclear weapons. They've developed those weapons over the last 50 plus years. Uh, it's been a very deliberate, determined program uh, to build that capability of what they call uh, a deterrent. A diplomacy has, uh, over the years, as one studies it carefully, and we at Stanford have done a comprehensive history uh, of the North Korea nuclear program and the interplay of technology uh, and policy. Uh, and uh, as we study that history, we find that diplomacy has often been able to slow down the process or actually reverse it in some cases, but never to stop that process. And of course, we're another one of those cusps today uh, as to whether diplomacy uh, can actually bring us back. Now, as I look at this from the Tar DARPA perspective, from a technological perspective, and I look back and say, if we would have had other technological means or capabilities, would that have changed the North Korea situation? Uh, and my answer is uh, no, I don't think so. In other words, this wasn't an inability for us to detect what they were doing, because quite frankly, they've done this in plain sight you know, of the international community, under international sanctions. And by plain sight, I mean they've actually allowed me to go into their nuclear complex. I've been there seven times. I've held their plutonium in my hands. I've seen their centrifuges. You know, so they actually wanted the world to know that, look, we have this capability. So this was not a technological failure. It was a political failure, a failure of will, a failure actually of the international community. On the US part, I would say the main failure combining it and looking at the technological side versus political side is not doing a proper risk analysis and not having the technological people be able to inform the political people what are the risks if we do such and such. And so as a result, North Korea has been able to do a lot with very little. The Iran story is somewhat different, but similarly, again, it was not a technological issue. How will these things change in the future? I don't think these will change uh, dramatically. Although the technology challenge will be as it is today in, the Iraq, uh, in Iran and might become uh, in North Korea, and this is a place where DARPA could help a lot, is in verification. Uh, so if indeed a country is going to be denuclearized in the end, uh, how, how, what does that mean? What do we need? So let me turn uh, then to the issue of nuclear terrorism. 
That's a very, very different issue. It's an entirely different problem. In this case, if you look at the motivation of terrorists, is to do harm, uh, to do as much with as little uh, as possible. And so in the case of nuclear terrorism, one bomb will do it. Uh, and so therefore, uh, you have to make sure uh, that for the bomb fuel, a few tens of kilograms of material for weaponization, you don't need a science and technology base, you need a few good technicians. Uh, and for the delivery, you don't need missiles, you know, a boat, a van, or a plane will do. The materials are very difficult today to make, and this is one of the places, again, technologically, where there is going to be a difference. Are there going to be easier ways to make the uh, bomb fuel? But as Andy just pointed out, you don't need to make it, you can steal it. And particularly, that was a problem with the dissolution of the Soviet Union. I I've been to Russia 55 times over the last 26 years, mostly to work actually with the Russians to make sure that their nuclear materials uh, don't get away. And Andy and I worked together in a place called Semipolitinsk, which today is in Kazakhstan, uh, where they had more plutonium essentially buried around that old test site than North Korea has ever made uh, in the 30 some years they've had their reactor operating. So in this case, uh, detection uh, is critical. Uh, and so we need to be able to detect, we need to be able to monitor fissile materials, we need to be able to help countries to protect their and safeguard uh, their fissile materials. And, and this is where the SIGMA program at DARPA uh, is really an enormous advance uh, to go in doing something that's a step function change in our ability to monitor. Let, let me just quickly then turn to the next part of nuclear terrorism, that is radiological terrorism. So here we're talking about a dirty bomb. Uh, and a dirty bomb means just spreading radioactive materials around. That's not a weapon of mass destruction. It's a weapon, as it's been called, of mass disruption. Uh, and here, in, in essence, you're able to instill fear, economic damage. So how do we look then uh, at the issue of a dirty bomb? Well, the bomb fuel is ubiquitous. It's, it's everywhere. These are medical isotopes. These are industrial isotopes, radioactive isotopes. So we're not talking about highly enriched uranium. It would be a poor, dirty bomb fuel, so to speak. We're talking about things like cobalt-60, cesium-137, iridium-192, or americium. These things are everywhere. There are lots of them. They're not so well protected. So the bomb fuel is there. The weaponization, unfortunately, it's simple. It's just the explosives and the radiological material delivery. A uh, particularly today, uh, a drone will do. So in this case, again, something like the Sigma program, detection uh, is absolutely important. Uh, and here also the interplay of technology and, and the social sciences is important. What is the motivation? You know, one of the greatest puzzles today is why hasn't a dirty bomb been exploded somewhere? And so one of the things that I'd like to see us do, and that's one of the places where DARPA could help out, I like to put it, how do we avoid the second radiological attack? The first one, unfortunately, it's going to happen someplace, sometime, because the bomb fuel is there, weaponization is easy, and uh, the delivery uh, is easy. How do we avoid the second one? The way we avoid the second one is we have to be prepared. And again, that preparation is both technological and sociological. These are the challenges that, that I see uh, for the future, uh, and I think they're great problems uh, for DARPA to attack. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Thank you Valerie it's and tough. Vincent, uh, for inviting me to speak, and uh, congratulations to DARPA on your 60th anniversary. I'm very honored to be here. I'm going to make six points uh, in my uh, presentation. Um, the first one is the history of terrorist groups experimenting and deploying uh, weapons of mass destruction is a history of failure. The second point is groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS have no compunction about deploying WMD. They believe they have a religious right to do so. The third point, which Dr. Tang uh, referenced, is a sort of a Moore's law in bio biology, which suggests that there will be more access to biological weapons over time, and these groups will try to deploy these kinds of weapons. 
the next point is groups like ISIS tend to adopt emerging technologies. We saw this uh, most recently in Syria and Iraq where ISIS was deploying uh, crude armed drones uh, repeatedly. Uh, so despite this record of failure to deploy CBRN, I think in the future, uh, these groups will certainly, uh, unfortunately, be successful, which relates to the, to the next point, which is these groups have recruited scientists, because my concern is not necessarily a terrorist becoming a microbiologist, but a microbiologist adopting an extremist ideology. So think about Bruce Ivins, who uh, you know, killed five people and caused a billion, worth, a billion dollars worth of damage uh, to the American economy shortly after 9-11. Ivan's motivations were idiosyncratic, to say the least. Uh, but imagine a microbiologist in Indonesia or Pakistan or pick your country uh, who adopts Taliban-like views. Uh, this is really, uh, I think, a, a serious potential problem. And the final point is that jihadi terrorist groups are not the only groups that we need to be concerned about. In this country, far-right extremists have experimented with crude uh, chemical weapons and, and radio uh, and, and some of the dirty bomb type uh, weapons that, that have just was described uh, just previously. So let me start with the record of failure that Al Qaeda has had, uh, notwithstanding their strong desire to acquire these weapons. You know, in 1999, Bin Laden said acquiring uh, nuclear and chemical weapons is a religious duty. In 2003, and Bin Laden, by the way, is not a religious figure. Uh, of, uh, you know, obviously, he's an important terrorist figure. But for the, these groups actually need a, a senior cleric to kind of give uh, their blessing to this idea. And in 2003, a, Saudi, a leading Saudi cleric issued a treatise essentially saying uh, that uh, the development and use of nuclear weapons and, and weapons of mass destruction was uh, religiously sanctioned. So these groups certainly believe that they have uh, the right to use these weapons. And in the pre-9-11 era, bin Laden was meeting with uh, leading Pakistani nuclear scientists uh, in Afghanistan to talk about developing nuclear weapons. Uh, they also um, acquired uh, uranium from the former, so uh, former Soviet Union. Now, Al-Qaeda, of course, uh, they're, not, you know, they're not sophisticated nuclear scientists. And, the uranium and the radioactive materials that they were acquiring were likely uh, radioactive waste from hospitals. And in fact, when the Taliban fell in, in Kandahar, which was the de facto capital of the Taliban, uh, US uh, personnel recovered uranium-238 uh, in, in a storage facility in Kandahar. But it wasn't highly enriched uranium. But certainly, they were interested in acquiring uh, these weapons. Certainly, they were interested in meeting with nuclear scientists who could help them. Uh, and they also, uh, within Al-Qaeda, there have been people with uh, advanced degrees, scientific degrees. I'll give you an example. Uh, a woman called Dr. Afia Siddiqui, uh, she had a, uh, a graduate degree in biology uh, from an American university, and then she had a PhD in neuroscience uh, from Brand Brandeis. And when she was arrested in, in Afghanistan in 2008, uh, she was carrying documents uh, related to chemical, biological, uh, radiological attacks, uh, and, and also uh, it seemed that she was planning uh, to uh, perhaps carry out an attack in New York City, and she's an, she is an American citizen. Uh, so I think that over time, uh, these groups will attempt to recruit scientists because they've done that in the past. Uh, they, you know, they were never able to, they were very interested in anthrax, so uh, they were never able to weaponize anthrax. Um, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, certainly deploying uh, chemical weapons on uh, repeated occasions uh, using chlorine uh, in the bombs that they deployed, and we saw ISIS doing the same thing. Now, if, you, if a chlorine bomb blew up in this room, uh, the, the, most of the people who would be dead would be because of the effects of the blast, not the chlorine. So these were not particularly effective, uh, but it certainly uh, shows that they uh, have no qualms about using these weapons. They've used them before. Uh, interestingly, ISIS, uh, when it took Mosul, which is the second largest city in Iraq, uh, they captured Mosul University, where uh, there was a fair amount of cobalt-60 in, in the lab at Mosul University. ISIS didn't seem to be aware of this fact, luckily, uh, because cobalt-60 would be quite useful in, in, a, in a radiological uh, uh, weapon. Um, so there's a certain, uh, you know, they, they, they're certainly interested in these weapons. They certainly believe that they have a religious sanction to use these weapons. Uh, they've tried to deploy these weapons in the past. Uh, they've recruited scientists. And so I think the, the, uh, the concern is, is, is warranted. 
That said, uh, moving forward to kind of the picture today, since 9-11 in the United States, there have been 450 terrorism cases, jihadi terrorism cases. In not one of those cases has the, ter the accused terrorist tried to develop or deploy CBRN weapons. In, um, and in fact, since 2014, in the West in general, of the 91 attacks conducted by jihadists in the West since 2014, not one involved a chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear weapon. Europol notes in, in, in its 2018 report, as in previous years, no terrorist attacks using chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear substances were recorded in the EU in, in 2017. So, you know, it turns out the terrorists prefer to use the tried and tested methods of the past, which are vehicle rammings, you know, truck bombs, etc. Um, they are adapting. Uh, the, the, I think the use of armed drones in, uh, beginning in 2014 by Hezbollah deployed an armed drone in Syria against an al-Qaeda training camp. Uh, you've seen ISIS use these drones uh, re repeatedly. Uh, I indicates that they are willing to experiment. Uh, but for the moment, uh, despite the fact they, have, uh, they think they have the religious sanction to use these uh, kinds of weapons, uh, we've seen scant evidence of, of them deploying uh, such weapons. Uh, recent cases, which I think are you know, troubling but not necessarily existential, in June, um, a woman was arrested in the United States. Uh, she was a legal resident of the United States. Uh, she had instructional materials to, regarding how to manufacture ricin. Now, ricin is not really a typical weapon of mass destruction. It's more of an assassination tool. Uh, but the fact is, uh, we have also saw in June in Germany, uh, the German authorities arrested a Tunisian man who'd allegedly uh, successfully created uh, rice and was plotting to use it in an attack uh, in, in Germany. So certainly, uh, we've seen these groups uh, experiment with, uh, with these kinds of weapons, not very successfully. Uh, and finally, in the United States, uh, when we've seen anti-government extremists uh, possess precursor chemicals for hydrogen cyanide gas, um, and others also experimenting with ricin. Um, and one final thought, which is, we, we, we think about terrorists acquiring nuclear, uh, weapons of mass destruction as a potential issue. I'm also concerned about the idea that terrorists might actually trigger a real nuclear war between the, the arm, nuclear armed states of Pakistan and India. And here's how, this ha here's how, how, how that would happen. If Pakistan mounted another kind of Mumbai-style attack in India where 200 people or more were killed, the Indian government would certainly respond. In the, in the previous case, they didn't respond at all. But, in, but in, there would be tremendous political pressure on the Modi government to respond to a large-scale terrorist attack that emanated from Pakistan. What would that response look like? It would look like an incursion into Pakistan Kashmir, taking out the terrorist training camps of groups like lashkar e taiba the Pakistans, which the Pakistanis who have uh, tactical nuclear weapons, might well be concerned. They've lost three and a half wars to India in the last uh, 60 plus years. Uh, they have a rather immature uh, nuclear weapons uh, doctrine. They may well deploy these weapons if they felt that the, they were going to lose a conventional war to India. So it's not only the concern about terrorists acquiring nuclear weapons, it is also the, the possibility of terrorists sparking a nuclear conflagration. Thank you. all of our speakers for sharing your uh, unique experiences and perspectives on the global threat landscape and uh, the challenges that we face today in terms of trying to keep uh, the U.S. and our allies safe, as well as the, some of the challenges we might face in the future. We now are going to open um, the session to questions. I haven't received any yet, so I will, uh, <laughs> I will improvise here. Oh, there um, we go. Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, so this is a question for all of the, our panelists. Should the focus be on mitigating WMD development and use, or targeting the people who fund, make, deploy, or use them? So 
we have to do all of that. We have to, and we've been successful. I mean, Peter, there are two theories of why the traditional terrorist groups like ISIS and Al Qaeda haven't succeeded in launching a mass WMD attack. One is um, stupid terrorists. You know, they just haven't had the technical capability. And I don't want to rely on that for our security. And the other is um, the incredible counterterrorism work that the United States military and law enforcement and our allies have led uh, for the last uh, over 15 years, where we've taken out terrorist groups and leaders. Uh, but that said, we have to do everything possible to prevent and to be prepared for when that attack happens, because there's a lot we can do to be prepared. And it needs to move from a sort of boutique effort within the Department of Defense to a sustained resource national effort to be better prepared to prevent, to find, and the Sigma Plus program is critical in that regard, but we're not doing enough given the scale of the threat. Thank you, anybody else? I would just comment quickly that, uh, I mean, I think just from the variety of views you got today, I mean, the problem is so broad, right? So I, I completely agree with Andy in the sense that we gotta take that full picture and we gotta try to attack every part of it, right? And so we gotta do it all. Well, Valerie, let, let, let me just pipe in. Uh, from my standpoint, in, in the nuclear arena, uh, for, for the nuclear terrorism, for the bomb, the mushroom cloud, uh, prevention is really important. And, and the critical link in the chain uh, are the fissile materials. Sure. Uh, and as I said, today at least, we don't think terrorist organizations can make the fissile materials. They need a reactor to make plutonium, uh, and at least the most direct way today uh, for highly enriched uranium, uh, the enrichment is, is centrifuges. Uh, and that's not so easy. Again, that may change somewhat. The reactor stuff won't change much. Enrichment may. Uh, however, the issue that both Andy and I brought up, and, and that is uh, the, num the amount of nuclear materials that are out there, fissile materials, when the Soviet Union dissolved, we don't know exactly how much they had. Actually, they don't either know exactly how much they had. But it was well over a million kilograms. Okay, if you think about that, it takes, let's say, five or six or so kilograms of plutonium to make a bomb. Uh, it takes a few tens of kilograms of highly enriched uranium, and they had a million plus. Uh, by the way, we were no slouchers. You, you know, we had 750,000 kilograms or so also. Uh, so then the issue there becomes the protection and safeguarding. So you, you have to put the focus on that. Uh, and those are the sort of things that Andy and I have worked on and the U.S. government has worked on. And you have to do that, by the way, in cooperation with those governments that have fissile material. That's where you have to put the focus. On the radiological terrorism, as I tried to point out, there the materials are everywhere. It's going to happen at some point. It's, it's strange. Maybe Peter can tell us why it hasn't happened yet. I mean, it really is quite strange. For the most part, my opinion is, so far, the terrorists haven't wanted to use those things. But there, the prevention, of course, is important. But the most important part is the response. We have to be prepared. And the way we respond to the first radiological dirty bomb incident is going to set the pattern as to whether we're going to have a cascade of these or not. And I think that's where the issue is. Yeah, I don't know why. I mean, it hasn't happened. Um, uh, I mean, one, one thing we have to be careful of, Eamon al-Zawari, who's now the head of al-Qaeda, in 1999 wrote a note internally within al-Qaeda saying, our enemies are so concerned about this issue of we weapons of mass destruction that we should start a program uh, in this area. And they devoted uh, $4,000 to what they called the yoga program, which is their code name. And they began experimenting with uh, you know, cyanide gas, killing. There's a famous image that was on CNN of a dog being gassed, probably with cyanide gassed. Um, and they set up a program run by a guy called Abu Kabab, a great sort of pseudonym, um, who, uh, who was in charge of their chemical weapons program. So 
you know, they're thinking about it, why they haven't done it. I mean, it's hard to, it's hard, I, I just don't know. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this is an interesting question and directed uh, to Sig and Vincent primarily, but feel, please feel free to address it, uh, um, Andy and Peter, if, uh, if you have some thoughts. Where does the EMP threat fit within the CBRNE program, or does it? So that, that's, a, that's a good question. So I, I, think, I think that, that certainly the, uh, the EMP, the potential for EMP threats there uh, does, does, does warrant attention and analyses. Um, I, I would say in terms, of, uh, in, in terms of some of the discussions within the government, I think there are folks looking at it. Um, but currently, you know, that, that particular um, deployment scenario um, other than the starting points of it, uh, at least the Sigma and Sigma Plus program are not covering directly the, those types of deployments. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it is something worth looking at mm -hmm. and thinking about. Okay. Anybody else? No thoughts? Um, let's see. Uh, Andy or anyone, in addition to efforts to prevent attacks, should we, sorry, should we be focusing more effort on developing our resiliency in the event of an attack. Absolutely, and, and there are different aspects of this. There's public education, there's exercising, uh, training, but the biggest opportunity we have, and, and DSO and BTO are doing incredible work that was launched by Larry Lynn and his team in the 1990s, and that work at the time was visionary, it was futuristic, but now the science has caught up. The field of synthetic biology is mature. We can make biological weapons obsolete. Oh, and by the way, doing the same things, we can take pandemics off the table, and we heard about that from BTO. So in the bio area, a national level sustained program applying the revolution in biology can make infectious disease and biological weapons obsolete. We can't do that with nuclear weapons. But we have a tremendous opportunity, and that's why I'm so excited to see these new tools being applied for biodefense. Anybody else? Yeah, my, my view is uh, resiliency is the answer to response. Uh, that's precisely what we should be aiming for. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our country is almost going in the other direction. Uh, you know, whatever the terrorist attack is, the yellow tape goes up and, uh, you know, those areas are roped off almost forever. I, I ran a number of uh, counterterrorism uh, workshops and conferences uh, with the Russians in the early 2000s. Uh, and at one of those uh, conferences, we actually invited a, a, a policeman from New York City uh, who had been uh, over in Israel uh, for the uh, prior four years to work with the Israelis to learn from the Israelis as to how do they respond. Uh, and what he described was the Israelis have resiliency. Uh, and you know how true it is, I'm not sure, but what he described is, is that when there is a terrorist attack at a restaurant at some place, the idea was from the Israeli government, within four hours, that place is back up. And what that demonstrates to the terrorist, you can't bring us down you know, by fear and the way we respond. That's what we have to be doing. We started an effort, uh, National Academy of Engineering, uh, here in the US also in those mid-2000s. Uh, and, and the effort was aimed precisely on how do we get cities prepared to respond and to be resilient. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we took an effort on chemical, biological, and radiological around the country to, it was like 10 different cities. I participated in one of those in Las Vegas. Uh, and it brought uh, together uh, first responders who were absolutely crucial uh, in that, and then government officials, both uh, local, uh, state, and, and uh, federal government, uh, and then some scientific experts. Uh, and we went through scenarios uh, to try to build that. We had this great program, it went on for a while, and then it, it died. And I, I don't think we're doing enough to build up this country's resilience to any of those. Peter and Vincent, do you have anything to add on resiliency? 
Not really. I mean, resilience is a political issue, and um, politicians can signal uh, the sky is falling or, you know, this too shall pass. And that's a political decision. And so, you know, and then also, you know, the media has a role here, good, bad, or indifferent, uh, which, you know, we can signal the sky is falling or we can say this too shall pass. Uh, of course, because the, let's say there is a radiological bomb in attack in Washington. It will be a very big news story. I mean, <laughs> uh, for, uh, and, and so that you cannot control. But you can kind of say, you can, as a, as a political leader, say, you know, this is uh, bad and difficult, but, you know, be aware that a radiological bomb attack is not a nuclear weapon. I mean, which is not news to anybody in this room, but would be something you'd have to say as a, as a political matter and make it clear to the American public that, you know, this is a, uh, you know, it, it's a big deal, but it is not existential. Uh, and so hopefully, you know, when, when and if this happens, because I think we all agree it will happen in a European city at some point, uh, the political leadership says the right things. Mm -hmm. and, and they need, as, as Sig was saying, they, you, 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 don't, you don't make those decisions the day it happens. You need to have thought it out before it happens. Uh, actually, I should have added, I forgot. We did include the news media also in this because it's, it's uh, a absolutely crucial. Patience. And the combination that interplay is important. For example, in one of the exercises, uh, was indeed a radiological bomb going off in a shopping mall in, in Minneapolis. Mm. Uh, and then uh, you pull together first responders, news media, technical experts. So I was the technical expert. So the first thing the technical expert goes, and today he, he can go to, to Vincent and his gang, I want to know what's, what's the radiological material. You know, I want to know what it is because that's going to determine how you protect yourself. Mm. And that the way that it was played out, they actually said it was plutonium. Uh, and then I said, well, thank God, it was only plutonium. <laughs> okay. The reason for that is because plutonium by itself, if you disperse it, the only thing you have to do with plutonium, you don't want to breathe it and you don't want to eat it. Yeah. You know, and if you can protect yourself from that, it doesn't do you any harm. On the other hand, if you get cesium-137, you know, because it's alpha radiation, and you folks know that, but if cesium-137 or cobalt-60, it's got gamma radiation, it penetrates. Alpha radiation doesn't penetrate. You have to protect yourself differently. And so the, this is where your, your sigma concept can come in to actually inform the responders uh, in a way that's useful. So Let me cite one success. I mean, I believe in the concept of deterrence through preparedness and smallpox. The United States has a stockpile of 350 million doses of smallpox vaccine. So a terrorist that requires a smallpox weapon is not going to use it against the United States. They might use it against the other parts of the world that don't have vaccine stockpiled. But we are deterring, and by vaccinating our forces deployed in South Korea and that region, we are deterring North Korea from using smallpox against us in a wartime scenario. So there is a lot we can do through preparedness that helps prevent weapons of mass destruction attacks. Okay. Uh, this question is for anyone. Uh, do we need to prepare for adversaries challenging U.S. agriculture in ways that may be difficult to defeat and or attribute? And how? So in 1997, I visited Tashkent, Uzbekistan, and we had programs to employ scientists that were involved in WMD programs. And the Uzbek Academy of Sciences gathered all the institute directors, and I said, do any of you um, think you might qualify to participate in these programs? And one by one, they stood up, and one gentleman stood up and said, "I'm." Dr. Abdul Karimov, I'm director of the Institute of Plant Genetics. Our institute developed plant pathogens as weapons to destroy the United States crops against wheat, corn, and rice. So the Soviet Union had a, a large program to develop biological weapons for anti-crop and also for anti-livestock. And I visited the networks of institutes for their anti-crop program centered uh, at Galitsino near Moscow and for their anti-livestock program at Pokrov and Vladimir. And so this is a very easy economic attack 
that could happen. And there's a lot we can do to prepare. Um, having a stockpile of vaccine against foot and mouth disease or rinderpest, these are things we can do to mitigate that threat. But we need, agriculture is 20% of our economy, so we need to take this very seriously. Anybody else? No? So I, I, and to, to those points, I, I think this is where, you know, definitely uh, DARPA can contribute from a technological point of view, right? How do we enable that scalable Y area sensing so that we are just have situational awareness of you know, potential pathogens in the background, what's normal, what's uh, abnormal? And uh, but, you know, it's a huge challenge, but I mean, that's what we mean by scalable sensing. Mm -hmm. So this is directed to, to all of you. Uh, you are scaring the heck out of me. <laughs> <laughs> what, what can ordinary citizens do to better understand this existential threat? They do. Um, you must have scared them. I don't think I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, the, the counter argument is, is, is these groups, uh, they have a, you know, they, they, they would love to deploy uh, a mass casualty weapon in the United States. They just don't really have the capacity. But I, but I think that for, as uh, we've all sort of said, I mean, Moore's law in biology suggests that they will. I mean, I have a really a question for my panelists here, which, I mean, gene editing seems to have a lot of promise, but it, uh, you know, the railways had a lot of promise as well, uh, but the railways made the American Civil War the most lethal war in, of, 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 of so far be, uh, because you know, lots of people got delivered to the battlefield in, 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 uh, through rail cars in a way that was, was, hadn't been the case in the past. So with every technological advance, it's both good and bad. So gene editing seems to be one of the most promising technologies we have. I, I can't imagine that there won't be people who will use it for ill. And so the question is, you know, what does that look like mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the scary scenario? I think the most important thing everybody can do is awareness. You know, the, if you see something, say something. Bruce Ivins, who launched those anthrax attacks in the United States, it took the FBI eight years to determine that he had launched those attacks. His, um, his colleagues, were, they thought he was quirky, but they were reluctant to say anything about him. Mm. Um, so just having that awareness, and Ed Yu from the FBI uh, WMD director talked about how they talked to young synthetic biologists at the iGEM meetings in, in Boston, the Jamborees, to let them know that there is a potential security risk to synthetic biology. So they're aware, and if they see something they'll do something about it and not just look the other way. And that's how we actually prevent regular terrorist attacks, too. Uh, Valerie, my, my own view is in, in the nuclear arena, I actually feel reasonably comfortable that we can look at the future and sort of lay out what the challenges are. Uh, to, today, my view is uh, chemical, biological, and not weapons of mass destruction yet. Uh, I personally think chemical will probably never become really a weapon of mass destruction, but biological can. Uh, and precisely the, the question that Peter asked, if you look sort of into that future, there's nothing but unknowns and challenges. And, and as we heard yesterday in the 60 years of DARPA, that's sort of what DARPA does, is look uh, at the future and look at the impossible. And that's an area I think it's absolutely crucial for this country to think a step or, or two ahead. And I just can't see it. It, it, it you know, makes me comfortable that I do the nuclear stuff. <laughs> Very good. I wanted to pick up on something Andy said. I mean, the FBI has looked at a lot of terrorism cases since 9-11, and the people who know the most about a potential attack are peers, followed by uh, family members, followed by authority figures like clerics and teachers. The people who know the least are strangers. The people who look most likely to drop a dime are strangers, though there's all these false positives, uh, and the people who are least likely to drop a dime are peers. Uh, so that, I think there's a kind of important lesson here about, if, you know, Bruce Ivins' peers maybe should have sure. talked earlier. So the discussion of synthetic biology is actually a good segue to the, the next question. Uh, with CRISPR technology, DNA and RNA could be weaponized. How could diplomacy and policy help to counter this development into weapons? Well, it's so new, we, we have no norms. And the governments can try, but also the uh, leaders in this industry need to 
established norms. And think about it, you know, would we be in the cyber situation we are today if 30, 40, 50 years ago when ARPA was creating the internet, if they had really um, given thought to the security risks and downsides of our dependency on this. So we have an opportunity to establish norms for responsible use of these new technologies. Well, you know, I, I find it sort of uh, uh, curious from a standpoint of diplomacy or I guess what, what one could call arms control. Um, you know, biological and chemical weapons are outlawed. Right? Uh, nuclear weapons actually are not outlawed. Of course, there's a treaty now that's sort of hanging there. But those things are outlawed, and yet the effectiveness of any real diplomacy in the, in the direction of chemical and biological, to me, is, is mostly non-existent. There are the conventions, uh, but I don't think we've figured out yet, you know, how do we face this common threat? How do we organize ourselves? Uh, in the nuclear arena, it was reasonably straightforward. Even, you know, Soviet Union and the United States being arch enemies, they nevertheless, they realized you know, what in essence finally Reagan and Gorbachev said, you know, nuclear war cannot be won, so their nuclear war must not be fought. We haven't set up that sort of a protocol yet uh, in, in the biological or chemical arena, and so it's sort of this no person's land out there, and I'm not sure how one takes care of that. Again, that's a huge challenge. You just touched on something which is just, I mean, just just is the exact point. I mean, in the, in, the, in the nuclear world, right, it's completely binary, right? It's very easy to say, you know, to know you, you cannot pursue this because if this happens, it's over, <laughs> right? Right. Um, in the biology world, I mean, with, with these advances, there are so many positive things that can happen with, as well as negative. So just fully defining that landscape, I think, I mean, it's something that we are doing and helping with. But uh, that's, and then setting up a political framework for that, it's uh, non-trivial. But important. I think Sig has redefined DARPA hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nuclear is easy. <laughs> Work on bio, because we need a lot of thought and and progress. But this is a this is one we can win if we if we make it a priority. Very good. Well, we're down to uh, under two minutes. I don't know if we have time for this last question, but we'll try and squeeze maybe a few thoughts in. Uh, Vincent talked about. Uh, the democratization of technology and the accelerating pace of technology development. So if you look to the future, where might we be surprised about uh, technology enabling new threats? And where might we take some comfort in technology helping us to address those threats? You have 15 seconds each. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the failed, assassination, the failed assassination attempt on Maduro in Venezuela, I think, points to the future where all public figures and public events are going to be, have to be thinking about armed drones. And I, if you think about ISIS, the, the ISIS playbook, I'm, the next iteration of ISIS is going to basically take that playbook. Will they use virtual reality for training camps? I mean, it's, a, it's not implausible. OK, anybody else? Yes, so, so my view in, in the nuclear uh, arena is, is mostly one of, uh, will there be an easier way to get fissile materials in some fashion? Can, can one harvest those in some way uh, with technologies that uh, at this point are not that effective? And so uh, since the mushroom cloud has to be avoided by not having fissile materials, that and then the protection uh, is really key. Okay. Bioweapons are just infectious disease. So we can eliminate that threat. And, and the work of national heroes like DARPA's uh, Matt Hepburn are leading the way. But we, it needs to, to then transition to the mainstream. Okay. I think, you know, as, I, as I've said, we, we just have to be vigilant. And at times, sometimes this problem, it can be hard to do that, right? Because it's not a daily thing. But we really just got to be vigilant and persistent. We've got to attack that full chain, right? Uh, securing materials, making sure we have capability for wide-scale sensing, uh, but also that preparation, right? Uh, so that people understand, you know, what are real threats and what may be more psychological threats, right? That resiliency. I think we just got to keep at it and figure out a way to how to do this, and you know, at the same time maintain our path forward. And keep at it. That's right. This has really been fascinating. Thank you to all of you. Please join me in thanking all of our speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much.